And good evening, everyone. I'm John Mobenzade, Executive Director of the MIT Mobility Initiative. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our Friday Mobility Forum. Um, our usual host, Jinhua Zhao, is actually on a long haul flight right now, returning from Australia. So he sends his regrets uh, that he cannot join us. Uh, but we do have a very special guest uh, with us today, uh, who I will introduce uh, shortly. Um, but just before that, just to give uh, Robin a sense of who's on the line, like we usually do, if you could just in the chat, quickly type in your organization, your city, and what time it is right now, just to get a sense of who's on the call. So. And whether you're awake or not, that's why we need to know what time. <laughs> All right. So we got Concord, Massachusetts, Santa Barbara, California, Detroit, Singapore, Cambridge, Argentina, Seattle, another Singapore, Princeton, Boston. Oh my gosh, it's moving quickly. Tampa, Columbia, United Kingdom, Brussels, Oman, Baltimore. Houston, Edinburgh, Munich, Detroit, Chicago, Boston, Paris, Jerusalem, Denver. Okay. I'm always amazed and impressed with our friends calling in from the Far East. Um, it's impressive to show that commitment to join these forums at such a late time on a, on a Friday evening. Okay, well, I'm super excited to uh, to welcome uh, Robin Chase uh, to the Mobility Forum today. Robin is a transportation entrepreneur. Uh, she's the co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar, which is the world's leading car sharing network. She's a co-founder of Venium, a network company that moves terabytes of data between vehicles in the cloud. In 2019, she co-founded her first nonprofit. NUMO, which is a global alliance to channel the opportunities presented by new urban technologies to build cities that are sustainable and just. And I, I by the way, I recommend everybody look at the guiding principles on mobility that were published by NUMO. Maybe you can put that in the chat, Robin. Um, her book is Peers, Inc., How People and Platforms Are Inventing the Collaborative Economy and reinventing capitalism. Uh, Robin has such a long list of credentials. She's on the board of the World Resources Institute. She's served with the International Transport Forum, the Massachusetts Governor's Transportation Transition Group. Uh, but she's also a graduate of Wellesley College and the MIT Sloan School of Management. So Robin, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I think we'll just start with a quick survey. Uh, so Bhuvan, if you could put up this question here. So do you believe that government subsidies on electric vehicles should be their top priority for decarbonizing transportation? So if the government had to spend a dollar, should they be spending the dollar on electric vehicle subsidies? Um, so please, uh, Start typing in your responses. I'm not seeing the polling moving, Bhuvan. Do you, do you see it? It is, it is. I'm just okay. waiting for it to hit 200 and then I'll probably just stop okay. it. So a few Super. seconds. That's oh. good. As long as you're seeing it. it. And you'll show it to me at the end or you show it to us? because I Yes, have... yes. So you have, it, it suspends. You have to wait for the result, Ross. <laughs> Yeah, so we're at about 250 participants on the call right now. So I'd say 200 oh, right. good. Good. Yeah, we've just hit 200, so I'm ending the poll and I'm sharing results. Okay, interesting. All right, so Robin, that I think sets the tone for, for your talk. And I will turn it without any further ado over to Robin Chase. Hello, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get to it. Okay. Um, I do want to say hello and welcome. Thank you guys for all coming. This was a great opportunity because it got me to pull the facts, pull all the facts out. So a lot of this I think you guys should know, and I think of you as my friends and colleagues. 
And I'm looking forward to a discussion at the end that's a real discussion. And so definitely be using that chat box chat, which I will get to read later. But um, I think these are critical issues. And so I want to hear what you're thinking. So I'm going to start with in the 1920s, when we were at the beginning of this new potentiality, the world population was around 2 billion people. Um, and this is what New York City looked like then. And you can see very few cars, definitely know what we have today. And I love this picture of the woman on the right on her electric um, scooter. And if you look in the background, you can see we could have gone with electric scooters or cars that neither were dominating. Um, it, the streets were free and clear, horses and pedestrians, some, some subways. And we chose personal cars. And I think the hopes and expectations for those were you know, you can expand travel distance, which is really important for getting to more jobs, for improving the speed of delivery, for seeing friends and getting to enjoy them. Um, it was going to clean up the streets. We all talk about the poop in cities and it would reduce the misuse of horses. Um, I lived in cities where there were still horses and it's horrifying to watch. And of course, it was a new industry and job creation and yay, new technology, modern progress. So there's all these great ideas. Um, so over the last hundred years, we specifically and proactively made personal cars the easy and cheap choice. Like we did it through, as you know, um, building those roads, requiring that office and residential and retail all had free parking spaces. All of our building codes and zoning was all built for cars, tax loopholes and tax incentives. We also didn't charge for any of the externalities that are associated with cars. We just kind of let them get off the hook. And all the things I just talked about, I think of as, oops, let me go back, as types of infrastructure. And infrastructure is destiny. It's a word, it's a sentence I use all the time. Because we built roads and we built far-flung housing and we gave those tax incentives and we required that free parking, we got what we build, that infrastructure became our future. And this is a really key point as we're moving forward. And so what did a hundred years of car infrastructure give us? This is the second order effects of unmobility. And I've had this slide for 15 years. And so it's the things that you all know, the CO2 emissions, particulate part pollution, crash, car crash deaths and injury, that's the giant household expense, it's space inefficient, increases cost of housing, encourages inactive lifestyles, encourages sprawl, it's expensive infrastructure and it's exclusionary, requires these things. So here we are, a century later, where population is 8 billion, not 2 billion. And we're at this new pivoting point of need and potentiality and spending and technology. Like we're, we, are, we are doing something to address what's happening in transportation. So we're at this new inflection point. What in heck are we going to do? And a whole bunch of people, in, especially in industrialized and rich countries and many foundations and big philanthropic groups and people that I really like and admire who are working on climate change, they say, yes, let's electrify personal cars. It's going to clean up the streets and all those exhaust and park particulates. It's going to reduce the need for fossil fuels. It's a new energy, new industry, technology progress. Yay. So here they are going down this path. And I'm saying, okay, so the second order effects of electric automobility are exactly the same, but we've taken out some CO2 emissions, some CO2 emissions, I'll get to that. And we're introducing all caps at the bottom of my list, this new environmental social political wars for lithium and cobalt and other things that we're gonna be adding to this list. So if I think about this, these second order effects are primary issues for politicians and for countries that we talk about safety all the time. We talk about the economic impact all the time. We talk about access. Let's get more people so they can move. We talk about climate and health. So I'm going to go through, this talk is going to be going through those four things item by item and seeing the implications here. So here they are and here we go. So if I look at the U.S. or so over the years, we can see that the VMTs, vehicle miles traveled, have been increasing since we started having cars, you know, and they are now in the billions. And over that time, we have been reducing the annual deaths per billion miles traveled. That's the red lines, like, go team, we've been working on this. But when you go look at it closer, oops, I don't know what's happening here, hold on. If you go in, oops, you can see that the US is in fact an outlier, that when we zoom in here to the last 
five years or last 15 years, the U.S., is one of the worst of the industrialized countries in terms of road deaths per million of people. And if I zoom in even further, um, this is the results of the pandemic, change in road deaths during the pandemic. And there is the US at the top with Switzerland. Everyone else had reductions in their road deaths with a few of us in this positive realm. We'll talk about why in a minute. And here is the US and I went and added in what it looked like in 2021 and then the preliminary in 2022. And it is a horrific death toll that we're seeing in, in um, pedestrians and cyclists also similarly. And I'm giving mostly US data because I wanted to have this consistent. You'll see data from other countries, some of it, but most of this is holding true elsewhere. So you can see we're having this horrific increase in, in deaths in the US. And why is that? One, we're speeding on those empty roads. And two, the mix of the type of vehicle fleet that we have in the US is getting increasingly heavy. So we see these SUVs coming up. And NHTSA did this 20, 2015 report. Pedestrians are two to three times more likely to suffer a fatality when struck by an SUV or pickup than when struck by a passenger car. So now we're talking about EVs. They're about 1,200 pounds heavier than internal combustion engines. So this 2012 Berkeley study being hit by a vehicle that's a thousand pounds heavier generates 40 to 50% increase in fatality risk. Recently in 2022, I like this sentence, the a bimodal distribution of vehicles increases the injury risk versus the baseline. This suggests that a universally lighter fleet once established would lower injury risk, while a weight-wise diverse fleet will increase risk. Remember this. And so from a safety from a safety perspective, electric vehicles don't solve any of our safety issues and do make them in fact worse because they're heavier. Um, and here, just I, when I was on a committee for the USDOT and they were all about safety, I'd say, you, you're about safety? Well, if you're about safety, get people out of cars. This These numbers here are 2000, 2009, and I've just explained to you how we are way, way greater than that right now. And so this number of 7.2, Eight billion fatalities is even higher. So if you really care about safety, get people out of personal cars. Are you guys seeing this bar of sharing? It's kind of in the way here, but I'll keep going. Um, and so car and car dependent transportation policies, I'm gonna talk about the economy, 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 economy. Sorry, I'm moving to economy. What portion of an American's income is spent on transportation? 17% of household income on average, that's across the board, 35% in the lowest quintile of people. I crazily found this chart of in people who are making less than 35,000 a year are spending 50% of their household income on cars. And here's this crazy in a map that someone made, counties where residents spend more than 50% of their income on transportation. And you can see that none of those are in big cities. It's in places where you have to have a car or you don't have a job. And so car dependent transportation policies leave individuals and households with very little economic resilience in times of economic stress. So we can think about right now and when you're a car dependent transportation country or city or location, this is what you get. So in car in addition to what it feels like to households spending just on their cars, car if you have a car required, it inflates the cost of housing by 25% or more. It depends where that parking is being built, the cost of it. And it increases the land requirements for retail and office use. And again, those costs get passed on to us as individuals. This is probably the worst case scenario. This is parking lots in Little Rock, Arkansas. And look at the amount of land that is just being squandered to garbageness, empty parking spaces or full parking spaces. And this is a famous um, two set here. This is Atlanta versus Barcelona. Both have a population of around 5 million. And the carbon footprint in Atlanta is 6.9 tons per capita. And in Barcelona, it's 1.16. Um, so, and all of this sprawl in Atlanta is enabled by a car-first transportation policy. So let's look at the economy from the government standpoint. When you have a sprawled built environment, it increased the cost of all municipal services and the infrastructure. So the pavement and electricity and internet, water, sewer, subways, it's all priced per linear foot, 
whenever you count this out and more feet to get the next one, the more expensive it is. The cost to move school children and the elderly and disabled to services, more expensive when you got to move them farther. Increased cost of health care. I'm going to touch on that later, that when you have an inactive group of people, they are much less healthy. And car congestion absolutely slows economic growth. Conversely, and the other argument I'm trying to make, when you are not spending money on your personal car, which was built definitely out of your locality, likely not in your state, likely not in your country, all that money is being sent out as well as fossil fuel money is being sent out of your locality. If you don't have to spend on that, you have money to spend more on more local things. So let's look at the economy from the private sector standpoint. And I think this is really where my argument falls down but I look at this and I think, which is more, in people, more important, people or this economic issue? So if you only care about the well-being of auto manufacturers and their employees, which is growing smaller in number, then, you, then I think this is what I think is happening, is that we are just saying, okay, electric personal EVs, personal electric cars is a great thing. We want to support it. But what we're seeing also is that these small EVs, I want to say V, I love that word vehicle to be interpreted to be a whole suite of, of sizes. And we are seeing that e-bikes are really game changing and are really on the upswing. So here's UK numbers um, and the US e-bike imports in 2020, 463 and in 2021, 790. So almost doubling and the total US e-bike sales was three and a half million in the US last year. And they are outselling electric cars in the US right now. The number of e-bikes are outselling the number of electric cars. So I think there's a lot of money to be made there. Okay, now I wanna talk about access. And this is something that I really am trying to tell my friends who are, and colleagues who I think have gone down the, oh, let's do personal electric cars as the solution. They are living in these industrialized Western countries where they think I go everywhere by car and everyone goes everywhere by car. This graph is showing you the population density in the metro areas around the world. And you can see the red at the bottom is the density of US, the US's biggest cities. And you can see New York and Manhattan as the, as the outlier of the US and how low down it is on the population density per square mile or per kilometer. So the idea that the future holds one person, one adult with one car or one car per one household is crazy and insanity. It can't happen. So if you're going to base your industrial ideas on car manufacturing, you are excluding all of these cities where this is just not the case. It is just not going to be happening that we're going to be driving in those cities and cars will be first. And so even when we go to the U.S. and look at the U.S., this is urban and rural populations in the US 1790 to today or 2010. You can see that here too, we have switched over to an urban population, largely urban population. And even when we think of the US as being very, very car centric, we know those statistics of, you know, 50% of all trips are less than three miles or five kilometers that people could be doing. And we have to stop thinking of Americans as living alone, surrounded by a farm. They aren't. They're living in small and large downtowns that can be densified and you can get to lots of places. Um, hmm. Let me just see if that was, yep. And so there's this, I went and did some research and I wanna, I'm, I wanna say this number 50% at any given moment, right this second in the US, 50% of the people can't get in a car and go someplace. Why? Because 25% are younger than 16, don't have a driver's license. 16% are physically disabled, can't get a driver's license. But 8% of drivers have had their license revoked at one time. 40% of the households have just one car. And if you live in that household and the car's out, you're also trapped. 20% of black households don't own a car at all. And as we said, for the poorest quintile, 32% of their income is spent on their car. And if you don't have the dollars to pay for that gas, you can't go someplace. So what strikes me of this 50% is it's 50% of humans we just write off. We don't even care about how they get around because we're saying cars and electric cars are the first most important thing to do. You other 50%, like whatever, figure it out. We're going to have other people drive you around. And so here's this is what it looks like for those of us who are not the 50% who are not in a car. This is a famous little cartoon. So here's where there are sidewalks, what it looks and feels like. And here's what it looks and feels like when there are no sidewalks. 
And I have been on these roads as we all have, and it's terrifying. And I just, I'm throwing this out here. This is how people travel in the different continents. And so it's um, public transport green, or I can't see it now because of my slide. So non-motorized transport green, public transport yellow, private cars red. My only point here is around the world, you can see that this mode share really can shift. It doesn't have to be all cars all the time, which is the second Houston up there is the first of the North American ones up here. Um, so the, we really have leeway here. These are choices that we are making. Okay, I want to move on to health and environmental impact. Oh, so so the answer is under access going for all, all electric personal cars is it doesn't improve access at all. And it makes things worse as we have those heavier vehicles <coughs> terrorizing the other people. So environment and health. This is something that was made by Toomey that I quite like. Whenever we think about cars, we're always kind of focused on, oh, the car crashes, which is here, this red bar. And we know that likely car crashes, deaths from cars will increase because of the weight. So we'll see that bar go up a little bit. And the red lung, see the red lung ones through air pollution. Um, we'll see that the air pollution from emissions coming out of the tailpipe does reduce, but problems that are caused by black particulates, black carbon and particulates, that does not reduce by electric cars. And that actually could increase because of the weight, the increased weight. But I really wanna call your attention to these two hearts, these little heart ones, which is through inactivity, that is the largest cause of our chronic poor, poor health around the world. And we're still gonna be seeing that. So it's a crazy thing to just be ignoring when we do all cars. This is a um, well used from OECD ITF and I put the boxes around it. This is if you care about addressing CO2 emissions, um, here's what trans, this is the life cycle analysis of these different mode choices. And I just made these boxes so you can see that cars, all cars, even, even ones that are all electric um, still produce huge amounts of CO2 emissions in their life cycle. And I guess my short form is, the, the green here is um, the fuel, is the fuel costs. And electric cars reduce the life cycle emissions of a personal car by a third. And a third is a lot, but two thirds are not reduced and two thirds will not be reduced by moving to electric cars. So we're still leaving on the table two thirds of CO2 emissions for cars in their life cycle analysis. And you can see that transit and micromobility is really the places where we see um, reductions into CO2 emissions. So again, just like safety, if you care about safety, get people out of cars and emissions, if you care about emissions, get people out of cars. And then there's this other thing I used to give talks on many, many years ago, which was the time to CO2 reduction. If you said, okay, today, we really care today, we're gonna reduce emissions today. The, for governments, the fastest thing they could do is introduce congestion pricing and that reduces emissions 25% overnight. Overnight in 24 hours, done, 25% down. We also know that lane reallocation for bikes, buses, and pedestrians, those can be quick build. And those absolutely, if cars, as, as we know, when we talk about induced travel, you build more lanes, more cars travel. When you reduce lanes, there's reduced travel. And when you build more parking, induced travel. When you take away parking, reduced, reduced travel, car travel. So there's things that governments can do that are fast. And then there's things that are medium term and really valuable. Zoning and building changes are important and they make impacts over the course of a decade and new mass transit also takes five to 10 years. From the people's perspective as individuals, cars are a significant capital expense. And when we're saying, okay, we're gonna make electric cars cheaper, people aren't buying new cars. Most people aren't buying new cars. It's rich old people who are buying new cars. Young people aren't buying new ones at all but we don't make those car choices very often. It takes 25 years to turn over the automobile fleet. So it's a really slow road if you're trying to do it that way. And e-bikes are much, much cheaper and you can make those decisions with much less financial weight behind you. And I stuck here because it just got announced. And I thought it was a great thing. Here's global e-bike incentives programs that were collected and it's ride review there, but you can have these slides later. Now we wanna talk about lithium. And I wanna say, um, a lot of this, this is this is the, the new second order effect that I think is going to be absolutely horrific. It's just 
pulling on our extractive, environmentally destructive, socially destructive things that we did to get fossil fuels. So to meet our climate goals by 2040 with status, status quo vehicle use, lithium extraction needs to be 42 times greater than it is today. This photo is beautiful. These are my favorite colors. And um, this beautiful lithium extraction fields consume huge amounts of water and, and many, many other really negative things. So I would point you, Leah Rio Francos just did this beautiful giant research report on it. I have links there. Because of her report, The Guardian took that data and did this stuff. I'm just going to go past these quickly. Um, so if Americans continue to depend on cars at the rate of 2050, the U.S. alone needs to triple the amount of lithium currently produced for the entire global market. Just imagine the chaos and the geopolitical efforts that are going to go through with this. And personal electric vehicles require more lithium provided than electric buses here are this nice Guardian produced um, nice piece. And you can see here is the e-bike is like nothing compared to a Hummer or a car. I did my really crummy slide way. Here is um, how much, like how heavy electric battery do we need to move one person? So there's your person. You could, for so one pickup or one equals, or one SUV equals two sedans, 55 golf carts, or 225 e-bikes. So if you think of that whole supply chain for lithium and cobalt, why in heck would you put it into these giant, big, heavy cars when you could be getting so much more transportation this other way? And I love this sentence at the bottom that I just found. Um, the Hummer battery weighs more than a Honda Civic car. <laughs> and it's crazy. Um, and here we are coming down to the finish. So for the price of a single gallon of gas, you can power an e-bike for 2,000 miles. Um, on. Did I stop sharing? No, we still see your slides. Good. You're still so good. I'm coming back to my landing here. So infrastructure is destiny. What we do and choose right now is gigantically important. And this, the other piece that drives me crazy about the electrified per personal electric cars is that we are refreshing this car fleet for another 25 years. And I don't think it should be refreshed. It should be allowed to like go limping into the sunset and be at a dramatically smaller volume in general. So infrastructure is destiny. It will never make sense to move a 150 pound person in a two to three ton vehicle. It doesn't make sense from a safety perspective, not from a climate perspective, not from a geopolitical perspective, not from an urban perspective, not from an affordability perspective, not from an access perspective. And I put another dot there because there should be three more dots. There's a thousand reasons why it doesn't make sense. And so here we are, 2023, population, 8 billion. billion. What are we going to be doing? I'm going to go past, you can see that sucked. And if we had car independence, which is where I think we should be, what we should be thinking about, if we are trying to make our population with our money, how do we make people car independent? We will have healthier people, fewer transport deaths, higher percent of the population mobile because they don't need a driver's license or a car to go, more money for local economies, cost of housing decreases, more land for agriculture and wildlife, more economic and individual autonomy, more mobility resilience, more per capita, reduced per capita emissions. And this cartoon just came to me on Twitter two days ago. Here we have- uh, Robin, I think your slides are stuck. Uh, it's oh, stuck at the- It's stuck at the slide of the, the, the dogs and the bicycles. Oh, yeah. there you go. I thought you were stuck. Um, how do I unstick you? Uh, you could stop sharing and just reshare, you know, to just trigger. Because I it thought that I was doing that. Shoot. I thought something happened. Okay. So did you see this slide? Where do we get to? Infrastructure's destiny. All of my litany. World <sighs> population. Here's what we know. The bicycles. The one oh, with the wait, dog in that car. Back. You guys missed a whole bunch. There, we, we got we, we stopped at the bicycles. Okay, well, so these yes, are just the slides. Price of gas, infrastructure is destiny. Here's the long list of why it doesn't make sense to do what we're doing. It is just stupid, will never make sense. And here we are, 2023. World population is 8 billion. What are we going to do? And we know that this was a stupid idea and it continues to be stupid and is worse. Like this just, this list does not get any better. But the second order effects for car independence is what I just said, all of these great things that um, 
can happen. I do feel like we should be thinking about second order effects. Here's this terrific cartoon that I just found. Roll back those decades of mistakes. We've really got to, we, we spent a hundred plus years learning what it means to have car first. Like we know, we know that. Why are we just, it's, it was bad. Um, and so here's my last slide. Our goal, I think, should be what is the, not the number of electric cars we're going to have by 2030 or not the number of electric cars we have by 2050. We should be saying, what is our goal is the percent of people with, we should be tracking the percent of people with zero carbon footprints or the percent of people with quality car independent lives. And our guide in this 8 billion person planet should be resource efficiency. And we, and actually making sure that all people are getting places where they need to go, not just rich people with driver's license and licenses and cars. So I am stopping there. I have other slides, but I'm gonna stop. Um, I'm gonna, sh th these guys will send out to you and will and I will share my slides and I have a whole bunch after this <laughs> that are just other facts. Other facts, I just thought too many facts, I'm pulling them out. Phew. Thank you so much. That that was that was fantastic. You know, I was looking through my notes and I realized that you and I first met 15 years ago uh, at a cafe in Harvard Square. And it, what I would say is I have really learned a lot from you over the years. And there's one thing that you said that has really stuck with me, which is we consistently underestimate the cost of ownership for automotive mobility. Right. And your your slides pointed to that, that, you know, 17 percent of disposable income in the United States is spent on automotive mobility. And I could say in Europe, it's about 15 percent. It's the same. Yeah. Right. So what what I'm trying to parse and I, I think I know where you're going to go with this, but you started this talk by saying we've made cars easy and cheap. So how can you say on the one hand we've made them cheap? But on the other hand, they're super expensive. Help us uh, through that. Easy and cheap in that there's another slide that I didn't put in here. And have you seen that if I invest $1, when I invest a dollar, society pays X. So if I spend $1 on a car, society pays $9 and all the negative externalities in that car. But when I walk, society pays like negative 23 cents because now I'm healthier but you can go through each of these mode choices because we don't because we have subsidized so many negative externalities and given so many tax breaks and caused other people to build parking for you that you is now free for you none of us are paying the true cost of car travel and so we're making our decisions based our decisions rationally based on what is the cheapest easiest most convenient way to go and so from a social perspective, it's the most expensive way to go by far. But for us as individuals, even though, even though it's expensive and a burden on families, it's cheap relative to what it should cost and dramatically easier than relative to other ways to go. Um, Introducing that notion of the social cost, absolutely. And, and one more thing I just, what I learned when I did yep. car is that when people think of the cost of travel, they think of the marginal cost. Oh, my cost of travel, I already bought my car, paid for the insurance, I never think about depreciation, and my parking at my home is free. So it's what is the cost of fuel to get someplace? But that's not the cost of travel. So we compare, should I take the subway or a train or should I drive? We think, oh, if I drive, it's only you know $1.20 in gas or it's only $15 and wow, that train ticket is so expensive or the public transit is so expensive, it's cheaper to drive, but it's because you're excluding all of the fixed costs. And right. um, Okay, one more, I, I noticed the chat was super active, so I know we're gonna have a lot to talk about, but one more point uh, related to, I mean, you said infrastructure is destiny. And, you know, I think you've painted a picture that infrastructure, you know, particularly our streets, we can envision a future where our streets really look different. You know, we've had leaders like 
Jeanette Sadiq Khan, what she did in New York City, really impressive. And just rethinking what should streets look like? And maybe they can be a little bit more suited for those e-bikes that you're talking about and a little bit less suited for privately owned automobiles. That's an exciting vision to think about. Uh, so infrastructure is destiny, but we can also imagine infrastructure being reshaped for a better future. But actually, somebody in the in the chat typed in, well, maybe land use is destiny. And now you alluded to this a lot when you talked about density and so forth. So I guess my question is about how how do you envision, you know, you spoke of the United States, you spoke of the low densities. It really is a question about where people live, where people, you know, choose where they work in relation to where they live, where they get their health care in relation to where they live. And those just seem to be far more intractable and, you know, socially ingrained challenges. How do you think about that? I mean, could can U.S. land use really start to look more, for example, like European land use? There's this um, number that was some McKinsey report 20 years ago, and I'm going to be making this up completely, but it was 50% of the infrastructure and the built environment we will need in N years, I want to say it's like 20 years, has yet to be built. So we that is true at any given moment, so that we're constantly refreshing highways, stores, buildings, sidewalks, cars. Like it's this constant refreshment. What we are doing now that is breaking the hearts of everyone who's working on climate is we're continuing to build things that we don't want and now we're repairing things that we don't want and it's going to give it another 50 year life, right? You build that coal plant, you're going to use it for another 50 years. You build, expand that highway, it's going to be there for another 30 years. So, so that's number one, that there is this huge change that's ahead of us. Like we can be building the right thing. So people are turning malls into mixed use places. Like we're seeing all sorts of infill and in building. The second piece is that we do, this is what I was showing that graph of the urban versus rural. If we were to look at the population of the US and where they live, it's not like there's a large percentage of people that are living in places where they can get to the essential services. They could get to the essential services and not a great distance. So I think that was a nice thing from the pandemic. How far away is the store, the food store, your school, the place where your friends are, the gym and swimming pool. Right now, back to this 50% of all trips are less than three miles, that is ubiquitous across the whole United States, which is saying 50% of trips and destinations are within striking distance, which like iterates my point that people are not living way out in the hell. Some people are, but most people are not living in really distant, distant remote areas. So I think we have to really think carefully so this was the piece around my 50 percent of people i would love us all everyone to start thinking oh yeah when i was a kid i was trapped unless i have a great bike route or sidewalk to go to school or to the library otherwise i'm trapped in my parents beck and call oh i remember being a young mother having to drive my kids to kingdom come because they can't move without me oh i remember when my useless brother lost his license for for nine months and that completely screwed his ability to get to work oh i remember when i you know like my my mom who shouldn't be driving anymore so we have to not instead of saying it's us against them saying oh this is me this is me this is me in my life i need to have a way that is to get to regular places without a car that would transform my life and so i think we can start there we don't have to say no no cars we have to say let's make this other mode of travel Mm -hmm. by walking, by bike, by e-bike, something by public transit, something that's viable, and then and start also making cars pay their full center. Sorry, we know that's a whole talk in itself. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn over to Bhuvan because I know we that the chat was very, very active. Yeah, uh, and I'd, I'd call on Alex to just kick us off before I just delve into the other questions. Alex, audience. Sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Wonderful. Thank you, folks. Uh, thank you, Robin. Obviously, always uh, fantastic to hear from you. Um, there's a lot of like chatter going on about like sort of the negative message versus the positive message and, you know, sort of how you, I, and I guess my question, yeah. pardon me? 
this was the message for this call. This yes, this absolutely. Human. And and, and so I guess we we're in a time where like somehow the fifteen minute city concept has become a QAnon adjacent rallying cry, and you know let's all acknowledge we do live in a in the for those of us who live in the U.S., there's a, there's a sort of quasi kleptocracy that homeowners have over land use decisions, whatever. And so, how do we unlock that in a world where somehow the 15 minute city has become a QAnon conspiracy? How do we unlock it to have homeowners get behind it? Because I think we're going to need them behind it to say, "Oh, I agree with biking infrastructure. I agree with density. All those things." Like, what's going to be the unlock there to get that support? Um. So a slide that I didn't include that's at the end of my deck was this very funny, um, someone asked Bing chat, um, how, why, why don't, why aren't politicians behind this movement? And then it listed, you know, what are the ways that you would do it? And among them is what is the story and what is the narrative? And I, because of who I am, I think unlocking, having parents think about how they are drivers like they are chauffeurs to their children. I think that's a really big win. How can we, how can we get our, and we've seen the bike bus happening now, but how can we get 12 to 16 year olds, 12 to 17 year olds to be totally independent to get to where they, and, and that is, so, so I want to double down on those things that they, that would be really helpful to them. Can my kid go to the store and get milk? I don't have to do it. I can send them on an errand. Um, or we also see that where there are greenways, people, and during the pandemic, the use of places to walk was a really positive thing that people talked about. There's a lot more use of trails and rail uh, trails. And so even in car built up, car dependent areas, when they have that nice bike path along the river or in this beautiful view, people go and use it. And so how can we get people to think, oh, well, let's connect you up to those things. Let's get more of that so you can get there. So I think there are ways. So the first step, I mean, this is also different. So you just asked me a question about cars versus no cars. And really this is focused on electric cars versus other ways to spend government money. All Thank right. You. Uh the, the chat is absolutely exploded. There's so much of activity here. Uh, so I'll probably start off with a question on the, the transportation cost, you know, relative share of income. You know, we said it was 17% for a car. The average is 17% up to like 50% in some places in the US. Uh, is there any data that you are perhaps aware of, you know, what this is for public transit, you know, families living in cities, you know, using, don't, not having a car using public transit? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it one? You know, so this is so you, you um, someone can go look at that. It's US house, US household survey data, budget data. And um, what's intriguing about that data is um, debt. When you borrow money, that becomes part of your household budget, which is why it increases. So it's not just your disposable income, it's how much you're borrowing to actually live your life. Um, I think I don't have that data, but I do not believe it matches these numbers. And if we had, what I would like us to be doing is creating resi resilient multimodal lifestyles that are possible. And so, okay, the bus is on strike now. Well, I can ride a bike and car carpool with friends, you know, or, I hate going underground, so I'm only doing buses and biking. I like whatever, but we need more resilience. Right now, with it, with it being when it's only one car's car or everything else, you're gonna get yourself killed. That's not resilient, and it's not the multimodal life that we should be leading. Sure. And we also uh, see in places. There's a lot of talk right now in Boston, where I live, where we have some pair, some buses, but signs are free. And if we think of the social costs of cars versus public transit, we have lots of money to use if we started charging cars what they really should be paying. Yeah, that was another question, you know, with the, the proposals to make these buses free, you know, would that cause another distortion, particularly to, particularly to shared transportation services? Yeah, this is why I would really love to see us, and I think there is a movement going towards this, again, another transition, is as we increase the number of electric cars for the last 15 years I've been on, we need to be doing road pricing as in priced per distance because we're using losing the fuel tax, which paid for infrastructure. 
So we need to invent a new thing. And I'd like us to have as many costs being variable and marginal ahead of us and not sunk costs. So when cities are talking about, oh, we're gonna we charge electric cars $500 a year because they're electric and not paying fuel taxes, I think, I don't like that solution. I want you to start charging everyone per distance for movement and for congestion. And then that will load up those costs. And again, it'll make you compare better between public transit and, and driving your car. Very true. We are actually working on a similar project with the Energy Foundation on alternatives for the gas tax. So we will connect later on this, Robin. Uh, the another question is, you know, the, the, the very interesting chart on, you know, the costs. So I think sedentary habits, you know, leading to, you know, the maximum portion of, uh, you know, the costs. I think, uh, so how is that number arrived at? That was one question. And I think one cost, which you mentioned, but is the time cost of chauffeuring children around because by, by the parents or siblings, so the millions of hours per day, you know, that are just lost because you have to take your kids somewhere is, you know, another cost which people probably don't consider. Um, so the chart that I showed was one that Toomey created, and that was a global chart. But I have gone and dug into the CDC for the US, and they have these very you know, for every pound Americans lose, then it saves n thousands of dollars. Like they have these links between inactivity and dollars saved in the. So those are things that can be found because I have found them and pulled them out of the CDC. Um, I could, I could go. I'll go stick that into some of that into my my online deck, and it'll be in the appendix. I'll go put that in the appendix. That'll be really helpful. Uh... So there's, I mean, while the discussions here have centered about, you know, personal mobility, uh, there, there were a few questions, you know, about freight and goods movement, you know, it's pro probably if it's, if, if it's in your house, it's traveled on multiple trucks. And, you know, also about the popularity of intercity road travel, uh, you know, beyond 100 miles, not the short trips that, you know, you said 50% well, of the short about, Let's talk about those two things quickly, because I'm looking at yeah. time. So one was the cost of delivery. That is something that drives me crazy. I've also been working on that for a while. Amazon has done this beautiful job of saying, pay me once, whatever it is, $87. I don't know, because my husband buys it. And then all of your all of your delivery is free for the next year. Again, pushing something into a sunk cost so that you don't consider it when you do this. And the road space and curb space and increased congestion, again, all of these are things that we don't charge for. If we were to charge for those things, then the cost of that delivery would, would, would be increased, right? And we would do what we should be doing, which is the US Postal Service aggregates all the delivery into one a day, one, one delivery a day. Um, but we really have, and I also have dreams of how I'd love cities to put a, I'll make this up, a $3 per delivery charge with four exceptions. One is if it were delivered from a store that was local, a local store, if it were delivered by an electric cargo bike or electric bike, a small electric vehicle, or if it were delivered by the US post office, you wouldn't have to pay that fee. But so to start pushing people towards reducing the footprint and reducing the, and making main streets thrive so that not everything is being shipped to you. Um, your second piece was intercity travel. Yes. So among the many startups that I've done and some that have failed, what I learned was, in Europe that has a very robust rail. And so in the US, people can be, cities in the US are car independent pockets, islands. But outside of the US city, you are 100% car dependent. In Europe, because they have such a robust rail travel, people are living car independent lives in the cities and also as they move between those cities. And yes, the US is gigantic and the distances are enormous, but even the places where we have megalopolises, we still don't do it. There was a tweet yesterday that was, Switzerland has the same population as Massachusetts and Connecticut, and they have 1,100 train stations and we have however many we have. But we've just made choices. It's not like we have to stop saying what about and doing this America, the whole gigantic piece of it. We're spending money in New England. We're spending money in Massachusetts. We're spending money in DC. 
let's spend it appropriately to these densities and to these places instead of doing this other stuff that we're doing. Uh, so a question about Zipcar, it, it had to come up. Uh, so uh, Dana Hoffman asked, you know, what what do you your, what do you feel is the place of shared vehicle models like Zipcar now? And uh, you know, what are the what are other opportunities for startups and private companies to build profitable businesses and help push society towards sustainable mobility? Um, so the Zipcar question is bringing to me on another place that I want to do a little mini rant. Um, many researchers or who are on this call, <laughs> there's we had all these, you know, e-scooters and e-bikes and Uber and Lyft, and there were all these research studies, and they were done in these silos. And the silo was, if this, if Uber didn't exist, how would you have got taken, how would you have gotten there? And you'd say, oh, I would have gone by personal car. I would have gone by public transit. I would have gone by public transit. And then they have an innovation. And they say, oh, Uber is killing public transit. And I think, no, <laughs> no, no. If you want to be car independent, you need a cluster of services. And the cluster of services include, sometimes I walk, sometimes I take a bike, sometimes I need the subway, sometimes I need a share bike, sometimes I need a zip car. Sometimes like we need to evaluate car ownership versus a suite of services. And if you asked car owners, how would you go if you didn't have a car? They're going to say in cities, public transit. I mean, if you want to go after people who are killing public transit, it's car owners who live near public transit who aren't using it. Like, so in any case, I just, if I think of Zipcar and a ton of services, we need to think what enables a car independent life. And it's a whole suite of things. It's not one thing because we have a life phase. And that's the other piece I want to point out is you are a baby. You are carrying babies. You are a student and have no money. You are a rich person, hopefully, not hopefully. You are a person who is sustaining your lifestyle, but you're sick and poor. We need to Transportation needs to fill this whole incredibly diverse series of life circumstances. And personal cars does not fit that. And a cluster of services, which is many, many things, does. Yeah, very true. A multimodal approach to transportation. Uh, so moving to the, the, the question about safety. So we recently had Boston College banning e-scooters on their campus. So, you know, they said, you know, people were driving in a dangerous manner. So, you know, so is there safety data for e-bikes? You know, how safe is it to carry kids? I know you, you Robin, you've, you know, you have, you have, you have, you've spoken about this earlier as well from experience. And uh, yeah, so how do we, you know, what's it's really the data? In, Paris, in Paris right now, either they've had it and I haven't paid attention or they're about to have it. They're doing a referendum on e-bikes and that's e-scooters in that city. And I was just in Bogota where they were wanting to get rid of motorcycles or really crush down on motorcycles. And so when I look at that, I have, I have mixed feelings, and particularly about e-scooters. What we saw with e-scooter drivers, many of them had never been on a bike a day in their life. And I would watch them, and they are driving crazy. They're like swerving and having a really fun time. They're not realizing they're going to get killed in a second if they do something stupid. And so and e-scooters are incredibly nimble. So if you are untrained on safety, in micromobility as if you've never ridden a bike before in your life. And, and these things are really nimble. And I was thinking about this in Paris, they are so incredibly nimble that without people culturally being with and trained to drive carefully, they're really easy to drive not carefully. Um, one day I was in Copenhagen watching a 21 year old man in front of me on his bicycle in front of me in the bike lane. And he put his hand up like this, like this to stop. And I thought, oh my God, a cool 21 year old man is telling me, oh, I'm stopping on my bike. I was just thinking how in the US we never do any of those hand signals on our bike except for, so, so I want to hold it open that I was thinking about, if we think about Asian, large Asian cities, Hanoi, Taiwan, Taipei, there's a ton of activity on these small nimble things and transportation planners want to say it's dangerous and horrible. Let's ditch it. Let's get rid of them. But is there is there narrower lanes? Is there better infrastructure? Is there better training? Is there better culture? Is there better fines to address these safety issues than to say let's ban them? And so I think I feel like we're in this exploratory moment. And I'm, and particularly around e-scooters, I was thinking, man, 
I can really appreciate how when you have a ton of pedestrians and a ton of traffic and a ton of people, e-scooters are poorly driven. Like who's dying? They're not killing people. It's generally a car that's kidding an e-scooter that's killing the e-scooter rider. Again, we always are. But can we train people to ride micro mobility carefully? And I'd like to think we can. And do we need to change the infrastructure to enable that? I think we do. Yeah, the, the smaller wheels, you know, need a lot of training. You know, you can't just get used to it. There's the Boston bicycles. people now. Boston people now. I was riding my bicycle on a slushy, rainy day in downtown Boston on a bike lane, and a woman in front of me with this little tiny thing. I I have an e-bike, and so it has an odometer reading. She was doing 18 miles an hour in rush hour tra slush traffic on her little wheel, and I thought, wow, you have some confidence in the road here that I do not have. It's crazy. One of the suggestions in the chat is breathalyzers on Lime scooters after 10 p.m. Otherwise, it won't start. Um, it's possible, but I want to reply to that. If you're really worried about, I used I had a, at one point I had a ton of reporters calling me about e about e scooters. You wonder what we could do right now is stop double parking in Boston. That would that would solve more traffic injuries and crashes than e scooters. You know, you want to you want to save lives, have cars drive the speed limit. Those are way more impactful than doing breathalyzers on e-scooters. So just moving to the last question on policy, you know, so after decades of work and politics trying to produce, you know, behavior change, changes in Washington, trying to move to a transit and alternative transport, we've seen less than a one to two percent change in commute patterns. So it makes sense that EVs, you know, with lesser carbon emissions seems like the only viable option given, you know, the limited timeline we have to, you know, meet this temperature threshold. So, so from a science perspective, you know, that's the only, it seems like that's the only viable option for a built, built up environment like the US. So. so let's just talk about, and I'm going to, this is a number I am making up, although I should have it memorized. Is it, is it a billion dollars that the US government is about to spend on subsidizing electric cars, which I can tell you is 90% of new car owners own their own home and 80% of new car owners make more than $200,000 a year. So should the US be spending a billion dollars subsidizing, subsidizing electric cars or people can go buy electric cars on their own. We're not stopping you from buying electric cars. They're way better to drive. They're faster, they're cooler. People who drive them like them. I don't think we have to spend money on that. I think we could be spending money on public transportation, subsidizing electric bikes for sure, building like the cost per CO2 reduction subsidy goes with e-bikes every time. But the bike lanes, like all of these things, because that is so, so building more better walking, biking, public transit with that, with that money. And it might be 200 billion, I tell you, I don't know the number, but the largest number is for subsetting electric vehicles, which is crazy. So, so just a point to clarify as, in, as we are on time. So uh, I think the subsidies for buying an EV of 7,500 qualify only if your income is lesser than, you know, I think it's 75,000 or 50,000 and it's a tax rebate. So maybe it's not for the 200K households. Yes, but but yes. who's going to be using it? Who? So they have that. And you're a person who is making that amount of money. Since when are you going to be able to afford a 50 to $75,000 car? Even if you get that off, those people are not buying co new cars. They don't have the EVs aren't there now. Yeah. Anyway, John, if we are at time, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Robin, thank you on. so much. I mean, because we, yeah. we did some work. We did some work before that. Before the IRA was written, we did some work for Washington on the numbers and who buys what, and those are the numbers I was quoting and not how it came. Out. I will say the the IRA that was put into law on August sixteenth did change a lot of things about the subsidy. There's no there's no current income limit, but they did impose sort of sourcing limits on, you know, where the battery is coming from and things like that, which is a very complicated uh, set of uh, requirements. Uh, but yeah, a very wealthy person as of now could still get the 7,500 uh, subsidy. So Robin, thank you so much for surfacing so many of these. Take me the chat. Super important con. Yes, we will be sending you the chat. Uh, we will be to all our participants. We will be uh, sending out the Robin's uh, slides. And uh, Bhuvan, maybe if we can put us into a room, just uh, the three of us. Uh, we have one question to ask you, Robin, just before we. You guys, thank out. you so much for coming, everyone. I really look thank forward you. to seeing what you had to say.
Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. And if you can just stay on for one moment.